Hello and welcome to Call Off the Thought and Sing. Um, it's great to see you all and good evening and good morning to people in America. And oh, it's lovely to see you. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Marzia. Hey, Mike. Oh, hi, Shay, behind the tree. Welcome. I think we've got a few more people coming, but thank you so much for being on time. Um, I'm Bryony. I'm your host. And with us today, we have Jamie Cato, we have Anthea Lawson, Jai Raj and Melissa Owen, who are going to speak and bring music. Um, and I'm going to invite you to sing as well, probably mostly on mute today, because we've got, again, such a big panel. Um, and as, you, as I think you know, so this evening we're going to, it's thank you for your heart. And we're going to talk about having a heart. We're going to talk about the intimacy and the politics of our emotions, um, why we might go away from them, how we can come home to them, and what that means to us as, as individuals in relationship to each other, and what it might mean for our culture or even our paradigm. Um, we're going to sing, and I'm going to release my second ever single in a minute. And, and my motivation for this series is like, well, I've got to release my album and share my music. And it's like, well, music's about bringing people together. And I just didn't want to release it via social media or in our separation. I wanted to light a fire and invite people from all over the world, really, uh, to come together around the fire and, and be with music, to listen to music, to use your voices and to hear each other and to share wisdom and to share worldview and feel part of a culture and feel part of cultural shift and cultural change that I feel is happening at the moment and that I would love for my music to be a part of because it's definitely informed and inspired by that cultural shifting. So welcome everybody. Um, Anna Barker is my fabulous assistant who's up in the corner there and I'm going to resist the urge to let people in. Anna, do you see the people in the waiting room and the, do you get that information? Yeah, so great, so you can let people in as they go. Okay, I'm going to just lead us into a settling to start. So <sighs> take a moment, feel your, well, feel the bases of your feet but you might be sitting cross-legged or, so whatever is lowest in your body, just bring your awareness to it and give it a wiggle so you can feel the sensations of your skin touching, whatever it's touching. Bring the awareness up the legs to the sit bones, probably you're sitting, give them a shift. So you can start to feel in the hips the weight of the body resting there. Like if you were to ask your sit bones, like how much do I weigh right now? Like right now they'd say three pounds. But I know I weigh much more than three pounds. So if that's happening in your body, just shift your weight from bone to bone. Sit bone to sit bone until your sit bones can start to feel more the weight resting on the support of whatever you're sitting on. Bring your awareness up your torso. Take a nice deep breath and a slow exhalation. One more, make any kind of sound on the exhalation. I think everyone's muted apart from me. Soften the sides of the tongue. And if your eyes are open or closed, come into what we call owl eyes, which is when your awareness is in the peripheries of your vision. And just bring your awareness into your heart. And have a little hum. Like hum into the heart and see what you feel as you do it. Just a little saying hi, and your eyes might be open or closed, they can stay as they are. I'm just lighting a candle to welcome us all here. We can't be around an actual fire, but this is a, a candle to be the, the symbolic fire. Honouring and welcoming each of you, just as you are. 
in all your actuality this evening. So much gratitude that you've made the space and the time to gather with one another and with me this evening. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. We're welcoming our hearts our emotions, be they in this organ pumping blood in the center of our body or in our limbic brains or in our bodies. The delicacy, the power, the beauty, the nuance, the gift of our emotions. And may we help each other come home to healthy emotions and healthy relationships with our emotions and with one another's emotions. And may this evening be in service to that. Welcome, everybody. So, pretty soon I'm going to play a song, a recorded song, not a live song, and then we're going to start hearing from each other. But one of the things about Call of the Thought and Sing is I want us all to have access to our voices as we go along. So it's more than discussion, it's more than headiness. We can shift gear. So... I'm going to lead us in a little bit of a warm-up. So just have a bit of a stretch of your body. You can do it sitting there. Just move any kind of way you want to move. Shoulders. And have a bit of a yawn into one half of your mouth and down one half of your throat. And the other side. Good. Stick your tongue deeply out, deeply in. Good. Inhale into your nasal cavities. And then make some kind of heady sounds, any sounds. And just give your voice some love and just say happy thank you more please to however it sounds and feels. Good. And some throaty sounds. Good. And some chesty sounds. Some diaphragm sounds between the brass strap area and the waist. And into the belly, have a breathe and see if the voice wants to go down there. Oh my goodness, Melissa, it's nice to see you. Welcome. And breathing into the pelvis, see what happens if you send the voice down there. Good. Move the voice all around the body from the pelvis to the head. Great. And then something that we often like to use, my students and I, is a thing called creature language, where you basically talk nonsense. So we go... So have a go at just expressing yourself, however you feel right now, in creature language. I'll shut up and give you space. You go for it. Does anybody want to unmute and let us hear their creature language? Minyana. Great. Okay, so let your creatures gradually come to an end of their expression. Um, so at various points, I'll say, okay, let's let's have a pause, let's call off the thought and sing. And then I invite you to just have a sing, use creature language, express yourself, move the voice, move the feelings. Yeah, okay, so I think we're tooled up. So, da, 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 I'm going to start by releasing a single, um, another single, and this is the second single of the album, and it's a song called Thank You For Your Heart. It was, I'll just talk about it for a moment before I share it. Um, it came, all the songs on the album that I'm releasing over the next few months came initially as improvisations. So this song came as an improvisation to my community in California at my leaving party. And I was looking around the room and to all my friends and community and beloved and I just started singing, thank you for your heart and different details. Thank you for your touch. Thank you for your dance. Thank you for holding me while my heart was breaking. Thank you for showing me all of your heart. And 
I feel like in my decade in California, a huge piece of my learning was about emotions and the heart and actually quite a lot from the woman who's moving around, Melissa Michaels, who does amazing work with, with dance and with emotions and with initiation. Um, yeah, very honoured to have her here tonight. She'll be speaking in May. Um, and I, I, I feel like in my experience of being a British person living in Britain and being now an American citizen living in America for a decade, there's a, a human ecologist called Alistair McIntosh who says you can describe cultures by three primary cultural ingredients. And one is logos, which is intellect and rationality in the mind and thought. And one is mythos, which is feeling and the heart and poetry and myth and ritual. And one is eros, which is the body and earth and rhythm and yeah. And I felt, wow, like Northern California, like mythos, the heart just actually has a different position culturally than it does in my experience of, of Britain. Um, and I had to learn a lot of skills about how to be with my heart, be with somebody else's heart. And I had to unlearn a lot of habits of numbing and suppression that I had picked up along the way, things like eating sugar and smoking cigarettes and looking at my phone and being busy all the time and trying to think my way out of everything, which I still actually do quite a lot. I haven't completely freed myself of that stuff, but I keep trying. Um, yeah. So this song I'm about to play. Troy Lush is the co-composer. He started playing the chords that night and, uh, and then I put the song on top of it. And, um, and the second half of the song is always improvised. And so the second half of this song, it's a live improvisation. So it's a live recording. So with no further ado, I will hope that everything works and I'll get it up and we'll have a listen. I just want to say, this might be me being selfish, but you know, earlier today up on the hill, I was watching a murmuration, a starling murmuration. And being an artist about to release a major album for the first time in my life, it feels like so much creativity has already gone into this. The creativity of the musicians and the singers who were there like that night, and then the sound technicians who recorded it and mixed it and mastered it, and then the filmmakers who filmed it and edited it. All these starlings in this creative journey, and now here we are. You're the first people apart from the team ever to see this video and you're the first people apart from the team ever to hear this song and I just say it means so much to me um, to be sharing it with you live in real time together um, so thank you for being here and here we go okay take a minute while I share my screen inside this form thank you for your grief thank you for holding me with your whole body as my heart was breaking into two thank you for holding me like a mother when i was struggling hard thank you for the ways you showed Thank you for 
<laughs> so, sorry if that ended. <laughs> oh, do you want to unmute? Brilliant, Brian. Oh, that's gorgeous, Brian. Loved it. Oh, I'm so glad. Should we should we call off the thought and sing for a minute? Do you want to mute and just and just sit, and I'll mute too, so we don't all have to. Hit, hit, and I'll just like uh, and just uh, make some noise, sing some sort of let your heart sing. See what it see what noise he wants to make right now. Beautiful, and maybe bring it to some soothing sounds, some quiet, some gentle sounds. Oh, it's really exciting to share this with you and be here with all of you. Um, I'd love to move now to some of the speakers. Um, I think it would be nice to hear from Jamie. Who, Jamie, are you there behind your behind your screen share? I'm here. Great. Um, so, Jamie, I invited you here because I follow you on social media. Jamie, Jamie's one of the only people here I haven't, the only panellists I haven't met in person yet. Jamie, I follow you on social media and everyone, Jamie's often doing these um, really supportive videos really about how to relate with ourselves. And he's encouraging us to, like, not go to the fridge and not go to the phone and not go to the thing but to make women feel even if it's uncomfortable and dare to feel um jamie did an incredible project earlier on in his career called one giant leap which is this amazing international musical inquiry about music and culture and unity and oneness and divinity i suppose yeah and, um, and Jamie, you've gone from music, it, it seems like more into a focus towards healing, healing workshops, intimacy workshops, personal development workshops. I hope I've got that right and correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, right. it's a big mishmash. It's a big mishmash. So Jamie, I'm curious, like relative to the heart and emotion, um, I wonder if you would be willing to share kind of personally about your own journey perhaps, and also professionally, like what you see working with people in your workshops really about how the heart can become a foreign territory, a numbed territory, and what it is to, to re-inhabit that territory, to, to come into a, a healthy, even a sacred relationship with our own and one another's emotions. Well, I don't know if I can do it quickly. I'll try and do the shortest version possible. Okay. The super short version is that because of the bizarre rule book we're given when we're growing up, and the way in our childhoods we're shown that the natural spectrum of who we are in our excitement, in our expression, in our body, in our vulnerability, in our emotion isn't welcome in lots and lots of different ways. Because when we're young and we're shamed or emotionally exiled or told off or guided away from all those essential things, we make a lot of editing in ourselves when we're young and we shut down our freedom to express from the heart because it's vulnerable to get laughed at or to be misunderstood or to be shamed or told we're too loud or we're too emotional or not enough this or to that. So we go through this big editing process uh, and hopefully we come across something um, when we get older, we realize that all that suppression and all that editing breaks down the intimacy. It, it blocks the deeper connection, it blocks our natural expression. And if that goes on too long, we start getting quite unwell or depressed or lonely or some mixture of those things. So, you know, I do what I do with groups and um, individuals to reclaim, unedit that process and bring back all those things that have been outlawed, the permission to cry, the permission to feel, the permission to move our body, the permission to be sexy, permission to express our ideas excitedly, share ourselves vulnerably, you know, all the sort of obvious things. And when we reclaim those parts of ourselves, the heart naturally opens, you know, it's not like there's a specific 
well, there are lots of specific things to do, but it's not like a specifically heart thing. When we stop and listen and allow those feelings to be felt that we've had to suppress, that we've had to shut down, hide, what people call the shadow, hidden away in the shadows, all these parts of ourselves. When we go to those places, we've kept them in the dark so long, it seems like it will be a very, very big deal, but actually it's not a very big deal. It takes courage once. And then when you've done it once, you go, that wasn't a very big deal. And all the other times, it doesn't take any courage at all. Uh, the first time takes courage because we built it into such a phantom. But yeah, when we uh, utilize our listening, our curiosity, our receptivity, our sensitivity, and just stop and be really, really present with each other, with our own feelings, with the stream of inspiration that I believe always wants to come through us when we focus on that and be like a cup that's ready to be filled, uh, the heart and the expression musically and artistically opens. There's a, the story of the Holy Grail is a bit like that. Uh, you are the grail, you are poured into by spirit or by inspiration or by music. That's the way it comes in, we receive it. Uh, and we've lost our receptivity along the way somewhere. There's a beautiful book called The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Narnia books. He was a crazy Christian mystic. And he wrote this book called The Screwtape Letters, which is letters from an old devil to a younger devil on how best to tempt his human. It's really illuminating books, beautiful book. And one of the chapters begins, my dear Wormwood, I, I notice your human's doing an awful lot of praying at the moment. Don't worry about this. As long as he keeps talking to God and asking God for stuff and asking God for forgiveness and the energy is always going from him to God, we've got nothing to worry about. It's only when he stops and goes silent and lets the energy come in the other direction and pour down God's love into him, which as we all know is true prayer, then we've got a problem, call me. Uh, and it's the same with releasing these parts of ourselves or, or our musical expression. It's about opening and letting the channel of inspiration move through us. It's a yin thing. It's a receptive, sensitive, stopping and listening and opening thing. Now, our lives have told us that that's a vulnerable thing to do. You might look stupid. You might come out with something that's not very good. You might not be perfect. People might laugh at you or think you're mediocre. Seems to be a massively risk, high risk thing to do. And while we live our lives from averting all those risks, we'll probably never do it. But if we soften into that and find environments where people aren't going to laugh at us or judge us and are willing to go on that sort of unknown path of what happens when I open and let spirit talk through me, sing through me, play through me, dance through me, then the results are often or pretty much always fantastic. That's my short version. It's still quite long. Wow. That was beautiful, and your 40 second wonder. Oh, thank you, Jamie. Wonderful. Well, everybody, would you like to take a minute to call off the thought and sing and just let your voice um, express a bit of how you relate with what you've just heard? I'm going to mute as well. Would anyone like to come off mute? We've got some amazing singers in the house. We've got Marcia Willis, Oshie Owen, Rachel Shea, Lissa. Do any of you want to unmute and just be heard for a moment? No, because it's <laughs> shyness and vulnerability. Um, oh, Jamie, thank you so much. It's wonderful. And I, hearing you, I've, I'm coming to the conclusion that I think you and I probably do quite similar work. And with mine, it's really focused around teaching improvised singing, but it's, it's a lot of what you describe. And some of the hardest things for people is to, is to be in the void, the emptiness, the not knowing. But that is the source of music for me. And that, that's the source of actually this whole album. It all came as an improvisation and the improvisational state is this kind of quietening emptying put, putting your bags down not knowing um and listening for what wants to come and then and then you start to hear the song and then that's what that's what you start following yeah and you don't have to do it publicly you know you can it's like you don't have to risk doing it in front of everyone right at the beginning if you feel a bit uh, insecure about it or uneasy you know Practice doing it with trusted people or on your own or in nature or, you know, and get into the swing of it until you build up some confidence to do it in front of an audience. I'm not saying go straight from hearing this concept to stripping off all the boundaries and exposing yourself. That would be a bit violent. You know, you, 
you can ease yourself. It's the same with artists, just because you're allowing the spirit to come through and seeing what happens. If you went to Picasso's studio, you would see some stuff that's absolutely incredible. You'd see some stuff that's great and you'd see some stuff that's well dodgy. Um, but he just doesn't hang those ones on the wall. And you don't have to hang on the wall the bits that didn't come through great. If you want the river of creativity to flow through you, you have to know that sometimes it's going to be great, sometimes okay, sometimes rubbish. Um, and, you know, look at Hendrix, John Lennon, Bjork, whoever, all the great artists, they all did some really shoddy album tracks. Listen to the ones halfway through side two. Um, we're totally obsessed uh, with it all being so great, but actually none of the great artists did continuous greatness, not even the really, truly, absolute iconic ones. But people don't have permission to do anything that's not great, so they start editing it before it's already come through. So the river turns into a trickle. Um, so I would say, you know, practice on the river being a river, even if it doesn't always bring amazing stuff. First of all, just practice on really being free with what comes through and also not taking it so personally. It's another thing. Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Play, Eat, Pray, Love, has a great TED talk where she talks about, you know, in the old days, the spirit, the, the muse used to sing through you or give you the creativity. You didn't take it personally. You turned up with your pen. And if it didn't come through that day, it wasn't on you. It was the muse's fault you showed up um, the muse didn't and if you had a great success that you didn't take all the credit either it was the muse it's only quite recently that we take it all as our own personal ego self-esteem issue whether we did something brilliant or not and i think that's a mistake you know it doesn't the great songs don't come from ourselves you do nothing to generate a great idea it's amazing how protective people get about that was my idea no well, not really i mean what did you exactly do to generate that idea nothing it popped into your head no one knows where it comes from. And to take it all less personally, I think, is a really, really good thing to do. Very hard in our culture. Very easy, easier said than done. Make ourselves good vessels. Yeah. Brilliant. I love this, Gilbert. Thanks, Jamie. I'd love to segue now onto Anthea. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Jamie. It's great to hear from you. Um, and he's jamiecater.com and he does all kinds of really exciting looking workshops. I want to get myself on one of them one day and, uh, yeah, and check out One Giant Leap as well on, on, I don't know, maybe, Jamie, maybe you can put a link to One Giant Leap. I'm not quite sure where people can find it. Anthea, Anth up next, Anthea Lawson. Anthea is one of my very best friends in the whole wide world. We met up a mountain in the Dolomites when I was 25 and she was 26 or something. I am now the godmother of her daughter and 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 I'm now her neighbour and we're both very happy about it. Um, Anthea is a terribly clever woman. She has a first in history from Cambridge and she was an investigative journalist with the Times and then became a deputy director of um, a leading NGO uh, doing a ton of work with her other NGOs as a campaigner. Um, Somewhere along the way, she had a breakdown. Somewhere along the way, she said, not a breakdown, sorry, what do you call it? Um, where well, you run out of energy. She had one of those at the, after a few years at the time. She, she ran out of life juice. Um, and, and that's when she went for blowing into campaigning. And after some years of that, she was like, something is up in what we're doing and how we're doing it. Uh, she took a step back and she wrote an incredible book called The Entangled Activist that was um, released recently, which is about really how activism can become more woke, more, more enlightened. And when we can see our participation in the systems we're trying to change and stop othering uh, the people we are, we're trying to influence and, and be beside them. Anthea, the question I want to put to you, and I, w I, want, I invite you to help us to see the big picture on this. Um, Jaya Raja, who we'll hear from later, he came once to um, spend a, a couple of days with my parents and I and help us with our relating and hold a space where we could hear one another. And one of the things I said to my parents, oh, well, do you know what, I won't, I'll keep a confidentiality, but one of the things I expressed to them was like, I can have a hard time feeling any kind of sense of emotional connection with you guys. And in the safety of Jaya Raja's holding, they said, bride, be, be gentle with us, please. Like we both went to boarding school when we were eight and we were really taught to put our emotions away, that they were dangerous, disruptive things and put them away. And I guess I partly feel like I grew up in a household where the, the emotions weren't named, emotions weren't displayed, emotions weren't, we didn't hold emotions for one another. 
well. And I guess, Anthea, the other prompt I want to put is there's this amazing film called Throw Down Your Heart or Throw Your Heart Down. And it's where this American banjo player, whose name I forget in this instance, he, he wants to take the banjo back to Africa and see how it connects with contemporary African music. And one of the guys in the film takes him to this beach that's called Throw Your Heart Down Beach. And it's called that because when the men were taken away as slaves, they would say, throw your heart down. You're not going to see your family again. You're not going to see your home again. You don't need your heart anymore. Throw it down here. It was throw your heart down beach. And now we, we might say slavery is an American issue, but it was Britain that shipped, I think, two million men as slaves to America before it was even America, you know, while it was still a British colony. And what strikes me, Anthea, is that both the children of the dominant culture and the men at the point of enslavement are saying the same thing. The children are taught, put your heart away. And the men are saying, throw your heart down. And my question to you, Anthea, is like, why would a culture teach its young not to feel? And how is that part of a paradigm that has been destructive? And how is recovering our capacity to heal how is that part of maybe finding a, a healthier culture? Um, and I, I ask Anthea this because I know she's going to write her next book on the topic and she wants to do a PhD on the topic. And, and her brilliant mind is saying, you know what, this is at the heart of everything. This is like the most important thing. And Anthea, you're wanting to kind of throw your intellectual energy into this question. And so why, why is it so important and what's here? And I know you could talk for many hours, so five minutes, let's see what you got. <laughs> and thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Bryony. Thank you for thank you for inviting me. Thank you for singing. Thank you for your album, your beautiful music. Um, yeah, I think I think these are the big questions. Actually, it's funny. I spent a lot of years and months and moments and months and years going the other way. Um, doing these detailed investigations, trying to say things about what oil companies and banks were up to, um, and to be able to say so without landing in an English libel court, which is hard, um, and sort of chasing the 432nd footnote in the French edition of whatever report I was doing, and then banging on policymakers' doors. And that was important, and it does need doing. But actually, I think this question of how our inner lives collect, connect to the world that we're creating together and the world that we're experiencing together um, is where I want to put my energy as a, as a form of activism now. So why would a culture shut its heart down and teach its children not to feel? I think there are lots of ways of answering that question. Um, you know, we could do historical accounts of, of how modernity, by which I mean the scientific revolution of the 17th century and the enlightenment of the 18th century, brought a, a separation of reason on the one hand and, and feeling on the other. And now running the public sphere on reason and rational grounds rather than feeling might have seemed a good thing in some ways. It meant no longer burning women who we called witches, for example. Um, but these developments also strengthened what had long been the case already, which is that feeling, which Euro-patriarchal knowledge often calls irrationality, was now being very clearly located in, in women, in children, in, in people who were uncivilised uh, and were going to be colonised. Um, and so this complete separation of reason and feeling means um, people don't want to people don't want to identify with it, people don't want to hear, don't want to be part of that. Um, and this is perpetuated in the public sphere through culture and it's perpetuated within us. We internalise this, this imbalance. We are, of course, capable of both. We're all capable of thinking and we're all capable of feeling. But it's become normalised in the dominant culture to denigrate the feeling source of knowledge in ourselves. Another factor then becomes safety. Um, so when our feelings are running high, it can feel not safe, um, especially if the feelings that are coming up relate to lack of safety in our past, if we're carrying trauma with us. And so we learn and the educational system reinforces this, to take refuge in our thinking and analysis. This is something I've done for years and I'm still learning my way out of it. We don't want to feel our vulnerability, is what Jamie was saying, and one of the ways that we avoid it um, 
is to, to sort of shoot up into our heads and back into our back into our thinking selves. But you know, there are other ways of answering that question of, you know, why would a culture teach teach its children not to feel? We could say, for example, that a culture might shut its heart down if the men who run it are afraid of the feminine um, in themselves and in women and its connection with interiority and feeling. And they're afraid of the feminine and that connection in themselves. Now, how's this this culture of not feeling sort of part of the bigger picture? How's that part of the culture of extraction and domination? It's completely entangled with it because not feeling that numbness in the dominant culture is what has allowed its people to perpetrate the injustices that create oppression and inequality. How can anyone do the things that colonizers did and still do if they've not suppressed the feeling capacity in themselves? I mean, that's exactly what military training does. It teaches people to override their discomfort at inflicting harm on others. And, and this works at a remove too. We're, we're living in, in the wealthier countries uh, of course, there's inequality within them, but we're living in a culture that it's sourcing its necessities and meeting its manufactured desires from places where people aren't being paid enough to produce them, where the land is being extracted from to breaking point. But capitalism works by making its extractions over there, somewhere else, not near us. And it's, and it's easy for that not feeling to be really not felt while the, the consequences are, are put somewhere else, put on someone else. So. So this question of how we create a, a healthier culture, you know, how do we enact reenhartment, Brian asked it the other day, um, is about teaching, teaching ourselves, uh, teaching the next generation uh, to learn emotional intelligence. And it's funny when I do workshops and, and talks with activists about this, before I even get onto the topic, we have to kind of go through this process of like, well, why is it okay to work on this inner stuff that is so much less important? Is that me at five minutes? Bro? That's the five minute bell, yeah, but you, okay. can, you don't have to stop well, dead, but you yeah, can yeah, I'll just, I'll, finish I'll just your come thought. To, I'll just come to a close on that. Mm. Um, you know, so we have to make the case that that is actually worth doing, that that is culturally radical. It's an absolutely radical act uh, to teach our children that it's okay to feel. Um, and that includes, you know, showing them what their feelings are. It means not doing some of the things we've been taught, like, oh, you're all right, you're not hurt. Oh, that's not important. Come along then. Um, how often do we not want them to cry because we can't tolerate the uncomfortable feelings that their crying is causing in us? So that's the question that I'm with at the moment. Um, probably my children will bust into the room and demonstrate some of this in just a moment, but so far it's going well. Thank you, Bryony. Thanks mm. for the to think about this. Wow, epic. Thanks, Anthea. And it's, it's quite uncomfortable to listen to you because you nail it, you know, and you go in and you say these really big, big things. Do you, does anybody want a bit of a shake? I know we like call off the thought and sing, but like, does anybody need a bit of a, like, oh, 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 oh. movement? And we will, we'll have a dancing break and a loo break halfway through. Um, and if you want to make some noise as well, you're welcome. Oh, yeah, hearing you, Anthea, you know, it makes me look like, like I, I want to get a healthier relationship for my heart because I don't like the way often the things I use to suppress it are like unhealthy, like sugar or whatever. But actually you're saying it's more than personal, you know, the impact of this quote unquote re is It's actually, the scope of it is massive. It's massive. I want to turn now to Owen and some music and then we'll have a break. <sighs> I met Owen at Tamara. Owen lives in Wales and he is a um, binational, bilingual human, Welsh and English, uh, and a very, very beautiful Welsh folk singer. Um, one of the first things that happened to me in Wales is that Owen took me to um, a night which right now I forget the name of. Marie the Mary Lloyd. That's Marie it, Lloyd. the Mary Lloyd. And I saw it, I was like, oh shit, I never realised we have an indigenous culture on these British Isles. And they have their own language and they have their own songs and they have their own rituals and it's friggin' beautiful. It's full of heart. The Welsh population has more poets per capita than any other country in the world. It's full of very beautiful music and it's had a long time of being treated badly by English neighbours. Um, 
Owen's going to sing for us, and I'm sure he has quite a few things to say as well. Owen, the Thanks floor is yours. Me. Thanks for being here. What would you like to say? I seem to remember sing? that night was also full of beer as well. I think that, but hey, it comes with the territory. I think when you've been colonised for a couple of nearly a couple of thousand years. Um, yeah, I was trying to think how to yeah the theme of the night and how to bring that from a musical perspective and. Um, <clears throat> We've got a word in Welsh, hiraith. Some of you might have known the word hiraith. Uh, there's no direct translation into English, um, but there's a Portuguese word, saudade, or saudage, I think, if I get my Portuguese pronunciation right. And it's... Saudade. Sa what was that, sorry? Saudade. Saudade, okay. Thank you. Um, it's a form of longing, really. Um, and there's a, there's a, there's a kind of there's a sweetness to it but it i mean from a kind of clinical psychological perspective it is it's a depressed state basically but you know we do we do <clears throat> we do wistfulness very well in wales and i think that's come from centuries as brian you mentioned of, of being colonized and oppressed and kind of marginalized and shoved to the western most part of the this part of the mainland uk and um i was thinking about so one thing that's interesting about the the word hiraith is it only really became part of the popular lexicon in the 19th century. So we're talking about the Industrial Revolution and Wales was at the epicenter of the Industrial Revolution. It was, you know, I think for 150 years, Swansea produced 98% of the world's copper. You know, it was like massive, massive scale industrialization in South Wales. And at the same time, you had the enclosures, you had um, church tithes and all this kind of thing. So a lot of people were moved off the land and into the towns and cities to find work. <clears throat> so there was a, a lot of heartbreak mm. that happened in that period. And it was in this period that this word hiraith really started, you start seeing it appearing in literature and in part of the lexicon. And um, <clears throat> I think there's a, there's a direct link between those two things, you know, that lack of connection with a place and being forced into, you know, very cramped, crowded conditions um, being forced out of your, you know, the place that you might have inhabited since the Ice Age, possibly. <clears throat> and um, I think often about the ramifications of that culturally today. You know, it's a, it's a word that, which is still used. It's very, uh, it's maybe over, overly popularised, but um, I think it, it summarises our general um, psychological state as a nation. And it's just, Ireland is similar. It's, it's quite a depressed state. There's a lot of alcoholism in Ireland and Wales. And uh, ben, I was in a cafe this morning and there was a signed thing of Benjamin Zephaniah. And Benjamin Zephaniah came to an Eisteddfod a Vod couple of years ago and he said, Wales is one of the most, colon, in terms of mentality, it's got one of the most colonised mentalities of, ever, of any place I've ever been. <clears throat> it's got a kind of minority culture. And I think there's a sense of resignation in Hiraith, which... <clears throat> I actually quite want to challenge. Um, it's important to express it, but I, I think it's also important to challenge it because it's self-defeating ultimately. That's, depression is kind of like self-sabotage, isn't it? So um, that's 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 been my thinking today about the the subject of of what we're discussing this evening. So I'm going to play you a Hiraith song, uh, basically, but it's got a good it's got a good um, good ending. And this song um, is a folk song. So all, all the tunes I play are from Ceredigion, where I live in West Wales. And it was part of a, a collection of uh, prize-winning songs at the 1911 Eisteddfod, because there used to be a, um, a folk song collecting competition at the Eisteddfod. Uh, so this was 1911, and it was collected by a woman called Jenny Williams. And she got it from a butcher uh, called Evan Rowlands, who had a butcher shop in Aberystwyth. Evan Rowlands was famous for two things. He was famous for his singing, and he was famous because he had a white, a giant white stuffed bear outside his shop. Um, because he was next door to the taxidermist, and uh, the Welsh word for taxidermist is stuffyard. In case you're wondering, um, and uh, Evan Rowlands had heard the sailors singing this song as they uh, left Cardigan Bay to go out to sea, and you know, back in the day, it was treacherous going out to sea. There's lots of tales of shipwrecks and death at sea and um, lots of ballads written about that kind of thing and so it's they're naming the places in and around Aberystwyth that they would miss and some of the people and um, 
so that's the th that's the kind of three quarters of the song and then at the end i've tacked on um a song called julio adre which means sailing home which is from the jay glenn davis collection of sea shanties and it means yeah sailing home coming home so there's a kind of full circle i guess in the song so here it is some kind of shape or like oh it was beautiful thank you so much for sharing beautiful voice beautiful song and it's lovely lovely to hear the Welsh language song thanks mm. I say mm. well, in Welsh you say so thank you from the heart that's what you say 
Is it? Said, thank you. Diojo yeah. Galon. Diojo Galon. Yeah. Mm, Galon. Mm. So I think now we'll just have a little break. Anna, maybe you could, <laughs> Georgia wants to hear it every night. Anna, could you maybe put on some background music and we'll just have a little like water in, water out bake. And then when I come back from the loo, I'll put on a song and we can have a dance. Um, and wiggle the body and shake the booty and uh, yeah so see you in a couple of minutes is that all right Anna yeah great in the recording I'm going to put on a song now for dancing and I invite you just to to have a dance around um share sound I'm gonna advance computer audio okay this is Ingrid Michelson You said there's something about the moon It rose too soon Are we doing what we should? You said it's life that moves too much We're losing touch but I'm not losing you There's a whole lot of heart in me I feel it under my skin And I know, and I know, and I know There's a whole lot of heart in me It takes a whole lot of heart to see Everything's coming Thanks for dancing, everyone. I'm going to turn my light back on. Oh. oh, it's good to dance. So it is. It's good to dance. Welcome back. Um, and welcome Harry Duns, who's just joined in. Harry, we've already played the music video. We played it at the beginning. Harry is the man who edited it. Um, and um, yeah, I think we should give you a round of applause, but you're 
on mute and uh, hello. Um, on that note, actually, yeah, so this is the official launch of the second single from Crossing the Album, Crossing the Album, Crossing the Ocean. Anna, would you put the link to it in the chat if anybody wants to link? And I've said to the presenters if they want to put their, sorry, I'm out of breath from all the dance, <laughs> if they want to put their, their links, their information, their websites in the chat, that's great because it's lovely if we can find them. Yeah, there it is. Um, and then Anna, would you also put my link tree in there, please? Um, my link tree is where, if you want, you can subscribe to my mailing list or follow me on social media. Or if you're terribly rich and you want to support an artist, you can become my Patreon or um, just find out about my teaching or anything I'm up to. Yeah, and I think Anthea's put hers in there as well. And there's Owens and great. Diorada, I would like to move to you now. And then we'll hear from... Melissa James, and then we'll all do some singing, I think, to end. Jaya Raja is a deep Buddhist human. And for many years, he was the chair of the board of uh, Buddhafield Festival, where I think many of us have been, and where I discovered, actually it was where, for students of mine, it was where the resonant body method began when I discovered Indian classical vocal there when I was about 20. Um, and he now runs a retreat center, a Buddhist retreat center in the West Country called Al Foxton Hall. He's a big nonviolent communication teacher and he's, he's intervened in my family from time to time to help us relate better with each other. And it's been incredible. I think every family should uh, have Jaraja come for a day, a year, and just clean up, <laughs> basically just clean up. <laughs> And then you're like, oh, look at these fresh new people that I don't have loads of baggage under the carpet with. <laughs> it's like, oh, they're really nice and funny. And we've got loads in common and they're interesting. So thank you, Jai Raja, for handling us all. Jai Raja, what have you got to say on the matter? And you teach nonviolent communication and a big part of that is empathy. So I suppose if we don't relate well with our own hearts, how can we relate very well with each other's hearts? And so how do we grow the capacity for empathy? How do we learn to hold another heart? How do we come into our hearts? How do we come into being able to relate beautifully with another's heart? Oh, you're muted right now. Thank you so much for being with us. Okay. Um, wow, how lovely to be here. The calm, man. Um, your song, Bryony, kind of choked me up and actually being here with you guys, just, uh, I do feel choked. Um, it's like the, uh, something about the beauty kind of sticks in my throat. I can't let it flow out. Anyway, so um, yeah, uh, you asked me to speak on bringing the heart to life. Yeah. So, um, I think the heart is already alive. What we need to do is come in relation to it. So um, I invite you right now to place one heart hand on your heart and one hand on your tummy. And uh, if it helps, close the eyes. There's nothing to do, nowhere to go just right here, right now. Notice how this feels. Notice how it feels from the inside as opposed from the thought. So much wisdom in the body. So the heart starts beating very soon after conception. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom your own heart and the beating of your mother's heart. Ba -bum. 
Ba-bum. Ba-bum. So we're born to that sound of rhythm, being safe. And the uh, feelings and emotions of our mother flow through our body as well. Ba-bum. 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 And for her as well, when she was in her mother's womb, the feelings of our grandparents flowed through her body. Ba-bum. 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 So going back through all our ancestors, processing, sometimes the frightening, sometimes the overwhelming, sometimes the beauty. From generation to generation to our own heart right now. Keats, the famous poet said, I'm certain of nothing but the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of the imagination. I am certain of nothing but the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of the imagination. Wow. The holiness of this heart that's beating now beneath your hand. It's the heart that connects us with our ancestry and with each other. So learning to speak to our own hearts with tenderness, like whispering love to our intimate partner. So maybe just trying, experimenting with our own name, whispering into the heart, Jaya Roger, I love you. Jaya you're lovable. And allowing that to resonate down into the heart, from the heart resonate down into the belly. And in that love, forgiveness, patience, We are flawed and we are beautiful. The French word for heart is cœur, which is related to the word courage. So to feel, to be in the heart requires courage. Courage to feel deeply. Courage to make mistakes. The courage to be intimate, not just with a lover, but to be intimate with life, with suffering, with grief, and with beauty. Thank you, Barney, for the invitation. Mm, thank you so much, Jaya for the space you've let us into. And everybody, I want to say you don't have to rush out of this space, but while we're in this lovely state of presence and interiority, <clears throat> um, just send a couple of hums into your own heart and see if you can feel um, the vibration of the sound. Mm. Maybe one more. Mm. 
Beautiful. And then, so that's singing into your heart. And now everyone on mute, I'll mute in just a moment. Explore singing from your heart. Just give yourself a few moments to let your heart make any kind of sound, any kind of say. Just see, just see what happens. Beautiful and gradually bring it to a close. Oh, she will make a shape for Jayaraja. <laughs> it's beautifully done, Jay. Thank you so much for doing more than a talk. Thank you for leading us into the state. And I love what you say, the heart doesn't need to be brought back to life it's alive we just need to relate with it with our awareness with our voices with our dancing with our with our own tenderness mm, thank you and with that i'd love to pass to our final presenter of the evening is melissa james of london who is a beautiful soul soul and blues singer and Ah, and Jairaja has a poem he'd like to share. I guess it's, is it going to go in the chat? Yeah, beautiful, thank you. Um, and Melissa, I think you do a lot of singing from your heart and you teach and you help people connect with their own hearts through, through voice. Um, will you sing for us this evening? So, and just to preface this, so this event was meant to be last Sunday but we changed it quite last minute to this Sunday and everybody very kindly shifted but it means that Melissa is on her phone from a bedroom in Pembrokeshire when she usually lives in London so she doesn't have her whole kit and set up so she's gonna she's gonna freestyle it for us this evening a cappella. Melissa over to you thank you so much for being with us thank you such a warm and wonderful evening I've just loved listening to everybody and been nodding my head I loved a lot of what Jamie had to say and oh, gosh, that was lovely I mean it's all just been lovely and really beautiful to hear your songs while Bryony so thank you for the invitation um I didn't expect it to be such a heartwarming evening you know I expected it would be nice but you know I didn't know what to expect so it was really lovely it's been really lovely um Sorry, there's back. You might hear um, laughter and all sorts going on in the background because I'm staying with somebody in Pembrokeshire, as you've just said, and um, and they've just been singing. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> and so much of I, I, just to preface what I'm going to sing, well, not preface it, but just to say, um, staying in Pembrokeshire, um, I went for a walk before coming here, and before coming back to do this session. Um, sort of just as it was approaching sunset and um and the place that I'm staying she lives really close well she just is surrounded by hills and it's just stunning I've never come to this part of the world before and I've been thinking where can I go to just like scream I really want somewhere to go where I can just sing at the top of my voice and also just shrill just wail and shrill and scream um, and so I've been running down the, <laughs> I spent my time running down the hills, screaming to the top of my voice, thinking this is great, nobody can hear me. And then I got back to the house and somebody said, I could hear you at the top of the <laughs> running down the top of the hill. But I didn't care, it was just wonderful. You know, we do need that freedom of expression because we just are so restricted so much of the time living in fear fear of what others might say judgment and um fear of getting it wrong as you said jamie fear of not doing something right fear, i mean it's just and i'm in the process of really and it is a process of trying to release my heart from fear and it's really hard once you enter the the door of 
or walk through the door of fear into a particular space, it's, it's really hard to unravel from that, especially if it's been with you since childhood. Um, but I, you know, that is my life's work now to, to try to do that as much as possible. Anyway, um, so the um, song I'm going to sing is, um, I was trying to think what to do. And, um, and I think I'm going to do the song that, um, for me, began my journey into opening my heart and connecting with it. I, just to briefly say, I, I wrote this song in about 2013. Um, with somebody called Ross Lorraine, co-wrote it together, just, you know, had these words and um, we created it. And um, and when I wrote it at the time, I wrote it about um, the situation that I could see somebody close to me was going through, a really challenging situation. And, um, and she was very mentally challenged. And it was hard for me to watch her go through that. Um, a mental challenge for me in another way and I wrote this thinking I was writing it very much about her and that situation and then two years later when I came to record it <clears throat> um, as I did as part of a record called Stripped Back in 2015 um, and then I'm recording it acoustically just with a pianist and listening through to it I mean it's funny you know when I first began the recording I chose a number of songs that I was used to performing with um, the pianist and guitarist that I was working with. So just I didn't to let you know, it. sorry, we've just got five. Oh, minutes. we're running out of time. Just to let you know. Sorry, yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay, um, but in essence, just to say, um, yeah, having recorded it acoustically, um, it just spoke to me so much more about me, um, and so began me on a path to discovering my heart. So. Um, so yeah, so this song is called Live Again. <clears throat> Can anybody hear me calling? Will anybody see that I'm falling? Is there somebody who cares to listen? Do anything I dare to mention? Could it be that there's another like me? Someone who understands what I feel. Will they see that I am lost and lonely? Just trying to figure out my story. Oh, but I know. Ooh. It isn't all about me. Help me now to live again. Help me now to live again. Can someone hear the screams inside me? I'm crying, oh, my face looks smiling. Might say I understand love's meaning, but I've never really known its feeling. Will you forgive me of my words that hurt you? Believe me how I never meant to. I speak yet, it's not me that's talking. It's just a fragment of my mind and it's exploding. How I know, I know, I know, isn't all about me. Help me not to live again. Help me not to live again. All I want is to be free. From the chains that bind my mind, keep my thoughts locked up. Inside, and I want to start to live again. Help me not to live again, and I want to turn my world around. But I need my feet firm on the ground because I think I am ready to start to change yes I am but first I need some help to find my way 
All I want is to be free from the battle of my mind. Keep my thoughts locked up inside, but I don't know how to be. Because I want to start to live again. Help me now to live again. Can anybody hear me calling? I want someone to catch me now I'm falling. I'm laughing but inside I'm dying. I want somebody help me now to live again. Won't you please come and help me now to live again? Come and hold my hand and tell me how to live again. Come and show me how I'm ready now to live again. I want to start to live again. Woo. Let's unmute if you want and give us some appreciation to Melissa. Wow. Woo. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, make a shape if she in some way spoke for you like if you're like oh you're speaking for me like <laughs> wow amazing thank you so much melissa thank great you. to hear you it's great to hear you wow oh everybody it's 7 30 yeah, you spoke for Georgia, you spoke for me, you spoke for many, you sung for many of us. It's 7.30. It's officially time to end. Can we go three minutes over and sing together? Okay, let's put our earphones on if you've got earphones. And if you want to, if you can, stand up. If you can, and still be home. And we're going to all unmute. If you don't have earphones, probably best to stay on mute. Oh, my lighting's going a bit off. I just want to thank you all so much for joining um, and being the very first people to see the single and hear the single. Thank you, Anthea. Thank you, um, Jamie, who had to go. Thank you, Jaya Raja. Thank you so much, Owen. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Anna, for tech support. Thank you all so much for being here. And I, I, my intention for Call of the Thought and seeing as we go is that there's more room to hear everyone's voices. And I'm sorry so far there hasn't been room for that because there's a lot of beauty and potency in all of your voices so now let's hear all the voices together and share our voices so we're gonna like go up and down a mountain together vocally we're gonna start with like a, a tone a hum a ooh, and then it's gonna get louder and then we're all at once in a very cacophonic way we're gonna just let our hearts sing if it's too loud for you just turn your volume button down and that's how you care for your ears and it's gonna be like maximum one minute a bit and then we're going to calm down we're going to come down the mountain into soft ooze and we're going to sort of lay this event down with our soft ooze and fade to silence are you up for it yeah so let's unmute feel the feet see unmute 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 you're unmute Coming down the mountain into soft tones, sibling tones, and laying it down. Ooh. 
Good night. I'm going to blow out the candle. I'm going to say hello to Gwen, my goddaughter on the screen. Hello, Gwen. Good night, night, night. And I'm going to blow out this candle and say much gratitude for the evening. May we keep coming back to our hearts and one another's hearts. And I wish I could remember Melissa's lyrics, but like help each other come home to our hearts, their tenderness and their truth. And know it's for us, it's for one another, and it's a deep act of yeah. personal and relational and cultural health and holding. So to that, should we all like blow out the candle together? One, two, three. <gasps> That's it. Oh. Goodbye, everybody. You're welcome to unmute as you Thank go. Thank you, Bryony. So beautiful. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bryony. Bye. Thanks, Mike. Great to see you. Can I ask, Diana? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How, how? Where do we find?